Now, what is entanglement? It's a very spooky concept. I mean, one particle's actions can be determined by another particle's actions, even when they're not related or exerting no force over one another. I mean, there's got to be some spooky action at a distance occurring here, right? So, what is entanglement actually saying? Well, remember that when we were talking about the helium atom, we said if the two electrons didn't interact with one another, if we pretend that this interaction didn't exist, then the wave function describing both of them would have just been the product of the wave functions describing the individual particles independently, as they would have been in the hydrogen atom. Well, I think divided by one fourth uh, to normalize it. But that's not what counts. What counts is that this is a product. It's been factorized. Now, here's the thing. When we generally have two particles in some sort of state, At any point in time, we can take a particle with half spin, an electron, for example, and summarize its state as some amount of spin up and some amount of spin down. So you have this. And that. In fact, um, I'm going to mark these with, let's say, U1 and V1. Then, let's say we have another half spin particle. It's identical to this electron. Then, we're going to have its state is some combination of spin up and spin down as well. Where's the noise coming from? So now, here's what we're going to do. I am going to multiply these two together in order to get a consolidated wave function that will tell me all about the motions of both particles. When we do that, what do we get? Well, I mean, it's just foiling. What's u1 times u2? u1, u2, half, 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 half. Then, what's u1, v2? How about V1 U2? And how about V1 V2? Now, I want you to notice something critical here. We want to be able to factorize this. That is, we want to be able to, oh, sorry. This should be some tension. So, a little product here, a little product here, a little product here, a little product here. We're not sure what this product actually does for right now. So now, here's what we want to happen. We want this to be splittable into all the terms containing only u1, u2, and v1, v2. Sorry. All the terms containing u1, u2, and all the terms containing v1, v2. We don't want any of the crossbred terms. But we have this, and we have that. These two wave functions that just 
won't go away. So the only way this could happen, this could work, is if u1 v2 and u2 v1 were equal to zero. But that implies either u1 or v2 is equal to zero, which contradicts with the notion that u1 u2 is non-zero or v1 v2 is non-zero. And the same way, this contradicts with either u2 or v1 being zero. So it contradicts once again with the same exact things. And so, these two particles must have these cross terms. That is, we can't isolate all the terms that only describe one particle's motion or one particle's state. So, when we observe one particle, that is not enough to talk about its wave function. We have to observe both particles in order to know both of their states. You could say that their individual states are sort of entangled with each other, which is why they can't be factored. Oh wait, that's why we call it entanglement. So you probably noticed that this is just for two particle states. Now, states with two particles are nice, but in the real world, in quantum computing especially, you can't do, you can't do much with two qubits. You have to move on. In fact, one of the most fundamental systems that are studied in quantum computing is the GHZ system, which describes the state of three qubits, which are each either all up, sorry, that's all down, or all up. So when you have three qubits working with one another, you don't exactly know what you're entangling. With two particles, you have two cases. Either they're not entangled, or they are. Simple, right? But with three, one could be entangled with two, and two could be fine with three. Or one could be entangled with two, two could be entangled with three, and three could be fine with one. How can we tell the difference? How can we know which are entangled with which? This is where Schmidt decomposition comes in. Schmidt decomposition tells us something important. So Schmidt, decompo Schmidt decomposition essentially takes the state of all these qubits and writes it as a matrix with some rank. Now, if a particle is rank 1, it's unentangled. And if it has a higher rank, that essentially means different levels of entanglement. You could say it gets more and more entangled. Finally, 
let's address what's down here. The einstein pedelsky rosen paradox. So, entanglement solves a big problem. The Pauli exclusion principle tells us if we have two particles with spin half, they can't have the exact same state. They're identical particles, so if they have the exact same spin, then their wave function is going to collapse. Which means if one has one certain kind of spin, the other must have a different kind of spin. If one has spin up, the other must have the opposite spin down. So, I mean, this seems to be a lose lose situation, right? Because relativity tells us nothing can move faster than light, including information. And that includes measurements from another particle. So here's the thing if we measure, if we have two particles, we already know one will be in spin up and one will be in spin down, and they're going to be constantly changing. So without entanglement, if we observe one, then that measurement hits us at the speed of light, which is fine, and we say, oh wow, this one has spin up. But that must mean the other one has spin down even though we haven't measured the other one yet. So by measuring this, we instantly know, a we instantly have a measurement of the other, which isn't possible. We shouldn't be able to get the state of both by just measuring one. And so that's where entanglement comes in. Yes, one of them is in spin up and one of them is in spin down. But you can't know which is in spin up and which is in spin down until you measure both. Their states are entangled with one another, which means you can't know which has up spin and which is down spin. And so that solves the Einstein Pedelsky Rosen paradox. Entanglement is also nice for that reason. It sort of makes the Pauli exclusion principle compatible with relativity. Now, the final thing is addressing ER, which is going to be very short, because it's not really related to quantum mechanics. ER, short for Einstein-Rosen bridges, are just another name for wormholes. Now, talking about them would lead me into general relativity, but for short, people have proposed that with the way that certain solutions to Einstein's field equation look, it looks like you could almost have an alternate secret path through space-time that outspeeds another path. So, there's almost this sort of hole in space-time that you can go right through. So, while light might take this path, following space-time's contour, as it always does, you can just bypass it by punching a hole through space-time. So, this is the Einstein-Rosen bridge, which is proposed because some solutions kind of look like it. And here's the nice part. Well, not really nice, but there's been a proposal by a Leonard Shuskin and a physicist who was working with him that entangled particles are actually connected by these wormholes. Now, it's a very far-fetched theory, but if it worked, it would at least give us some connection between quantum mechanics and general relativity, a thing that we're desperate for right now, given the current state of physics. So, 
that's it for Entanglement. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.